Thank you. Good morning. Welcome to Rework Deep Learning Summit. Uh, just want to call out, if you're feeling snug in the back, there's a lot of real estate up front. I have a whole table to myself over here. Um, so I love to take things apart. When I was a child, I uh, took apart a mechanical clock, gears everywhere. I was fascinated by it. And then I figured out that you really understand what's going on when you try to put it back together. Um, that's what we're going to try to do this morning with deep neural networks. If you prefer your AI to be a little bit mystical and unknowable, um, you can slip in your earbuds. I won't be offended. You can tune out. Um, but if you'd like to get a sense of what's going on under the hood, that's the goal of this talk. Um, machine learning models are, you can think of them as transportation, ways to get from one point to another. And uh, within that world, deep neural networks are like automobiles. They're really good at getting from one point to another, provided some conditions are met. If there's a road between them, if you're scaling a cliff, if you're crossing an ocean, there are modifications you can make to make that happen, but a car is usually not your best bet. Um, now, a lot of people have stretched deep neural networks very far and gotten them to do a lot of things that they weren't originally intended for, but what I want to give you a sense of is what they are best at, what they're naturally suited for. Now, in the world of cars, right now we see uh, the equivalent of people running the quarter mile and shaving off thousandths of a second and comparing their Formula One racers to the other teams and seeing who's a little bit better. And that was a fun game. I don't want to talk anybody out of that. What we'll be doing here, just to set your expectations appropriately, is building from the ground up like a Model T Ford. So you can get a sense of what the principles are and just know that there's lots of elaborations on top of that. So um, this is the equation of a straight line. Um, and I want to call out a trigger warning for math. There will be equations throughout this presentation. You can safely ignore them and still get the gist of it. Feel free to, to uh, gloss over it. But it shows the relationship between two things. Perhaps the price that you set on something and the number of those things that you sell. And you take the one thing, the price, and you multiply it by a number, maybe three. And you add another number, maybe 12. And then you get the number of things that you sell. This type of relationship is called a simple linear relationship. It's really common, and it's built deep into a lot of our machine learning and statistical tools. You can actually represent this another way. So imagine that you start with your thing, your x, say your price that you set, and then you multiply it by a number, m. That's that rectangle on the line. And then you have another input coming in from the bottom. In this case, it's one. It's always one. And you multiply that by b, and then you add them together within that square box with that squiggly sigma to get y. This is just another creative way of representing the exact same equation. Um, it's called a graph, not like in the sense of plotting something, but in the sense of some dots with some lines connecting it. But this is a graph showing a straight line, a linear relationship. You can change the symbols on it. It's still the graph that shows a linear relationship. It learns things that look like this, just boring, vanilla, straight lines. Um, and you can take it, and you can actually add more inputs. And it's kind of fun. If you add another input, now we have a two-dimensional input space, it's called, on the bottom. And now instead of a straight line, we have a plane. And it turns out you can add as many inputs as you want to go past this many dimensions. It starts getting called a hyperplane. But that's just a fancy word for a line in more dimensions. Um, now, this little thing, this little line, has a number going in and a number coming out the other side, so there's no reason not to hook it up to another thing that looks just like it. Use its output as the input to another one. <clears throat> this, you could call it another layer of the same thing. Um, and it turns out you can do that with these straight line relationships, and you can actually even connect them in more than one place. So your first layer can learn two lines, and those two lines could be inputs to the next layer, and you can combine them all back together. And when you do, the output is still a line. 
Um, surprisingly, this doesn't do anything. And this is actually one of the great properties of linear operations that make them so useful sometimes, is you can multiply them and add them and multiply them and add them. And when you're done, you still have a line. It doesn't matter how many times you do it. And you can add more layers, and you still get straight lines. OK, so useful, but limited. This is not the deep learning magic we came to learn about. So the trick, the whole specialness of deep learning now comes in with this triangle with an F in it. This is a nonlinear squashing function. All that means is if you imagine your straight line extending up and down, you bend the bottom up so that it never gets below a certain level, maybe a zero, and you bend the top down so that it never gets above a certain level, maybe one. And when you do that, um, in this particular way, this is with the logistic function, it keeps it between 0 and 1, and you get this elongated S shape. Now, the steepness of the S and the direction of the S and the location of the S is what changes, but it's always going to be an S shape. This is uh, creatively called a nonlinearity, something that is not a line. And you can now, with this, go back and do what we did before you can actually add multiple inputs and see what it looks like in a slightly higher dimensional space. And here, now we get something that looks like we have two tables side by side with a tablecloth kind of going between them, and the tables aren't quite level. No matter how we rearrange the numbers in this neural network, we'll always get something that looks like this. So this is really useful now if we want to take and separate something into two bits. So we can, we'll go back here. So we can say, well, anywhere that this wavy line, this wavy plane is closer to one, we'll say it's one category. And anywhere where it's closer to zero, we'll say it's another category. So if we wanted to take our two inputs, let's say price and location, and then be able to determine whether or not something's going to be profitable, yes or no, then we could have down on the bottom, one input is price, one is location. These little lo diagonal lines that you see crisscrossing there, those are what the model might come up with, saying this combination of price and location is pro profitable and this combination is not. But that separator is always a straight line. This, by the way, is logistic regression. Uh, whenever you run logistic regression, it's doing something like this, usually in many more dimensions. But this is it. Um, there's another squashing function we can use. It's very similar to a logistic function called a hyperbolic tangent. Despite the fancy name, it's almost identical mathematically. It just goes between minus 1 and plus 1. Again, it's just different variations of an S shape. But this one's kind of nice because it does have that symmetry between minus 1 and plus 1. Now, this, you can take and take the output of one layer and connect it to the input of another layer. And you can connect it in multiple places. Um, the number of places that you connect in the middle, uh, sometimes those are called nodes. And uh, because they're not input and they're not output, you're not measuring them. They're inside the model. They're called hidden nodes. So this is a neural network with a one, sorry, two layers. So it has a layer of hidden nodes in the middle. And you can make as many of these as you want. Now things get fun. So by taking these nonlinear bits and combining them, instead of just S's, now we get um, very sharp rises and drops. We get valleys. We get peaks. We get squiggles. You can start to imagine how you can represent more complicated functions with this. This is why neural networks are powerful because you don't have to know exactly what kind of a squiggle you're looking for. The network can find lots of different kinds of squiggles and find the one that best fits the problem you're trying to solve. Um, there's no reason not to add another layer onto that. And in fact, the deep and deep neural networks comes from adding many layers, maybe a dozen or a hundred or more. Um, there is, for this particular type of neural network, there's actually a really fun result that says that if you have a two-layer neural network, if you have enough connections between them, you actually don't need any more than two layers. What lots of layers get you is it lets you reduce those number of connections down to a reasonable amount, but that conceptually, 
It's still the same set of things you're learning. Bumps and squiggles. So um, now this is kind of fun because we can do, now we can do classification. Let's say this neural network is trying to learn whether or not our strategy is um, profitable. And let's say we have price down on the bottom and profitability. And anywhere where it's above zero, it's profitable. And anywhere where it's below zero, it's not. So if we draw vertical lines everywhere our squiggle crosses zero, we can categorize those as here are the regions where this price would be profitable, and here are the regions where it wouldn't be. You can see that it can represent complicated things, where it's not a single dividing line or a straight dividing line. It can be uh, irregularly shaped. So this is another way, this is to what we, how we represent what we just saw with all the symbols removed. So this might start to look a little bit more familiar. And in fact, our arbitrary node on the bottom that's always one, we can take that off too. That's called a bias node. Usually it's just assumed. Um, so this may start to look like what you've seen before when you've seen schematics of neural network and it looks very abstract and, um, and fancy. All that's going on there though, like we talked about, some multiplications, some additions, and some squashing again and again. So you can add more than one input to this deep neural network. And when you do that, you get a higher dimension output. So with two inputs now, we have our two inputs plus our output, and we get some really cool shapes. These are all shapes that come from taking a neural network and just choosing random values for everything and seeing what pops out. So this is to give you a sense of the types of things that it can learn. And the way you would use this is you would have a bunch of examples. Let's say examples of, well, here's a price I set in this location and this was profitable. Here's a price I set in this location and it wasn't profitable. And if you have a hundred or a thousand or a million of those examples, you can use it to train this and learn the weights that morph this surface, this landscape, so that it shows in red the regions where you're not profitable and in dark green the regions where you are. Um, you can also add more than one output. So instead of just wanting to say whether or not a single thing is present or absent, that's a, a binary classification, just a two-way yes-no classification. That's very, very useful. Um, sometimes you might want to say whether here are two things, which one is present. So and a great example of this, if you have an image and you like to categorize it as being an image of an open road or of a pedestrian, um, you can see that this is a very simplified version, but if you reduce it down to one variable, then you can see on the left, uh, open road, the blue, is out on top, but then there's a region in the middle where the salmon colored is out on top, and then a region on the far right where the salmon colored is out on top. So this would help be able to take images with different values and classify them into one of two classes. So we can do this because we have the two different outputs generating two different wiggles. Um, so you can probably see where this is going. There's no reason not to add more outputs. Let's say we also wanted to classify street signs. Another important thing. Same thing, just create a new region wherever there's a new squiggle that comes out on top and label them accordingly. And here we can see if category A is open road, we have a couple of regions that represent that. Street sign in the middle and then a pedestrian on the right with the region C. Um, so Cool, we can take, and, and you can do this with thousands of categories, and people do all the time on a data set called ImageNet, sorting things as finely grained as different breeds of dog. Um, now there's something I wanna point out here, which is not always clearly communicated. If you look at the far left, um, where open road is the clear winner, this is the intuition. When a model reports this is an image of open road, that communicates that that model is confident that that's the case. Um, but if you look at the second category A, that little narrow band uh, just in the middle, you can see that while the open road, yes, it's the winner, 
it's still really low. Like it's well below zero. And it's not that much higher than the other two. So in this case, yeah, it would be reported as the winner, but the model's really not that confident, and it wouldn't take a very big change for one of those others to come out on top. Whenever you're working with neural networks or interpreting the output of neural networks, if you don't have also a confidence report, then you're not getting the whole story. This is just a nugget to keep in the back of your mind. Whenever you're reading um, a technical paper or a popular press about neural network classification, um, there's more to the story sometimes. This is part of the reason why in images, sometimes you can change a single pixel and get it to report a different category. It makes them very, very touchy in some situations. Um, and of course, there's no reason not to do this with many inputs. For instance, with all of the pixels in an image. And when you do that, you have to use your imagination here. Instead of just two inputs, we have millions of inputs. And instead of just the one output, we have thousands of outputs. And in each location in this space, it's looking for which output is the one that's on top, which is, has the highest, higher than all the others, at least by a little bit. In that case, it chooses it as the winner. So with this in mind, um, I hope you're well situated to now go through the rest of the talks and understand what's going on, understand some of these cogs. I want to repeat the caveat that this is the clunky Model T version. This is genuine deep neural network, but it is the simplest version. There are other kinds of squashing functions. There are other kinds of fancy layers in the middle, especially for handling images. Um, and there's a lot of other fun things that can be done. But underneath it all, this is what's going on. It is powerful, but it's not magical. Thanks for your attention. I'd be happy to take any questions you have.